Hey everybody, it's Mr. Ray. Today we're going to learn about the harmonic series in music. So what is the harmonic series? Basically, it's this invisible mathematic code that's inside every note that we play. So if we play a C on our instruments, the C note isn't the only note that vibrates. There's also a lot of other notes that vibrate and they fit this mathematical formula. The math behind it is pretty easy to understand. Basically, if you think about a string, what we're gonna do first is divide the string in half and you find the middle point. And then we're gonna divide the string into thirds. And then we're gonna divide the string into fourths, then fifths, then sixths, then sevenths, and so on. And each time we divide the string into these smaller parts, it causes a particular music note to come out. And we can't control the pattern, it's all encoded into nature. It always goes, you split it into half, then thirds, then fourths, then fifths, and so on. It's probably easier to understand the harmonic series when we look at a tool called a spectrogram, or a spectrum analyzer. So that's the tool we're looking at now. We can see my voice reacting to it. And on the left, we see a 20. On the right, we see a 20K. What those are measuring are hertz. As we already know, hertz measures how many vibrations in one second. So on the left are sounds that vibrate 20 times a second. So 20 hertz, which are very low sounds, low vibrations. And on the right, we've got 20K, which is 20,000 hertz, which is a very high sound. And this happens to be the extent of the human hearing range. It goes from 20 hertz all the way to 20,000 hertz. And we can't hear stuff that's above 20,000 hertz, and we can't hear stuff that's below 20 hertz. As you can see, when the spectrum analyzer reacts to my voice, there are no vibrations way down in the 20 hertz range. My voice can't produce sounds that low. And likewise, there's nothing above about 10 kilohertz. About the highest sound I can make on this graph is with a lot of consonant sounds like tss, you see how it reacts up in the 10 to 15K range? So you can roughly see where my voice sits in regards to low sounds and high sounds. Now check out what happens when I play flute on the note A that vibrates at 440 hertz. You'll see that there was a distinct spike at 440 hertz on the graph, and then there were also spikes after it that weren't quite as loud as the first one. Watch it again. Now all of those spikes you see after that are different notes with inside that first note, and those following notes are called the harmonics. The first note, the lowest note that we play, is called the fundamental. The fundamental is always the lowest note, the lowest frequency, and then the harmonics, the other spikes you see, are always higher frequencies. So the first two spikes, or the first two harmonics we see in musical intervals are a fifth and then an octave. Watch the graph again and see if you can point out where the fifth and the octave are. So if we know the fundamental note that I'm playing is an A, which is 440 hertz, then what frequency is the octave? As you already know, every time we go up an octave in music, the frequency doubles. So if we multiply our fundamental frequency, 440, times two, we get 880. So see if you can find on the graph, when I play this, the spike that hits 880 hertz. Now humans can detect probably the first eight harmonics. So within this fundamental tone, we can see all of the harmonics and their spikes. Now imagine those notes, if we were to alter some of them and bring some of them up and some of them down, it would alter the sound of the flute. The word for the sound of an instrument is called timbre. It's spelled T-I-M-B-R-E, but it's pronounced timbre. And so if we altered some of these harmonics and brought some of them up, it would alter the timbre of the flute. It might make it sound rough. It might make it sound more like an oboe. So you know how even when different instruments play the exact same note, you can tell the instruments apart. That's because they have a different timbre. A flute sounds different from an oboe. And if you were to look at the waveforms of each of these instruments, you could see that the harmonic series for each is arranged in a different way. The harmonics that are emphasized with a baritone or euphonium sound are gonna be a different shape than the harmonics that are emphasized with a saxophone sound. <laughs> So 
So this is actually how synthesizers mimic real instruments. They start with a fundamental, and then they find out which of the harmonics a saxophone emphasizes, and they make their synthesizer mimic those harmonics. Now this math formula is something we can't change. It's encoded. The interval jumps go fifth, then fourth, then major third, then minor third, then major second. It always does this no matter what note we play, the spikes or the harmonic series that are within that note are always going to follow this pattern. It's encoded into nature. So why is the harmonic series important? Because these specific notes are arranged in nature, our ears are encoded to pick up these certain intervals. This is why when Pythagoras 2000 plus years ago was experimenting with strings of different lengths and he figured out what an octave was and what a fifth was, they could hear that the interval sounded perfect. It was very consonant because when you play an octave, those two pitches sound very nice together to our ears. And that's called a consonant sound. And Pythagoras figured out the interval of the fifth. When Pythagoras went up a fifth and then up a fifth and mapped out the entire scale, he was mapping out the notes that sounded very consonant to his ears. Pythagoras used these first two harmonics in the series, the fifth and the octave, to map out the entire scale that we use today, the major scale and the chromatic scale. This is the first reason why it's important to know the harmonic series. And the reason these particular interval, particular intervals, <laughs> particular interval, intervals, particular, particular, and the reason these series of intervals were so consonant to his ears is because they're encoded in nature. Every note we play, there's actually spikes of these other notes that are within the note. Now Pythagoras didn't have a spectrum analyzer, so we skipped 2,000 years of knowledge when we just looked at the spectrum analyzer and we saw the harmonic series without having to do any math or anything. Now there's a second reason the harmonic series is very important and that's for brass players. When you're using a tube to make a sound and you speed up the vibrations, the notes that come out are going to snap in place following the harmonic series. So it's gonna go up a fifth first, then up a fourth, then up a third, and so on. Now you might notice I didn't use any finger changes at all. All I changed was the speed of the vibration, which is how fast I was buzzing my lips. As I buzz faster, the sound will lock in on the next note up on the harmonic series. Before trumpets, there were bugles, and bugles actually didn't have any buttons. They only relied on the harmonic series for what notes they played. And you'll recognize the intervals in a lot of bugle songs that you already know. So the harmonic series is very important for those two reasons. And you can learn a lot about your instrument by exploring where you're hitting on the harmonic series. Are you on the second or third or fourth harmonic? If you're a brass player, start on the lowest note you can play for every fingering, and then play buzz up faster and play up the harmonic series. Train your ear to recognize those notes. So now you know what the harmonic series is and why it's important. And we need to learn about the harmonic series before we can understand why the scales are arranged the way they are. So go grab that old trombone out of the closet and start buzzing with it and experiment with the harmonic series. If you want a bugle, just make one out of a garden hose and a funnel. Garrison, show them the harmonic series on your garden hose trumpet. Now go practice.